Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program, the first in a series on the topic of Healthcare Market 2.0, Consumers Plus, with today's program being Consumers in the New Front Doors, presented by Foley and Lardner and Oliver Wyman. I'm Alexis Bortnicker, Senior Counsel at Foley and Lardner on the healthcare industry team, and I will be moderating today's panel. Today, we are lucky to have with us a, a great speaker, four great speakers who will engage with us in a conversation about the changing front doors to healthcare, the legal and regulatory issues involved, and opportunities and risks that will emerge as both incumbents and new entrants strive to deliver entirely new levels of choice, convenience, quality, and value to the healthcare consumer. Before we get started, I have to get a little housekeeping out of the way. Today's program will run for one hour and we will apply for one general CLE credit. Anyone wishing to receive credit for today's program must enter the code when announced. A box to enter the code will appear on your screen for approximately 30 seconds. Everyone seeking CLE credit must enter the code in the box on their screen at that time. All New York, New Jersey, and Kansas attendees applying for CLE credit must also fill out an attorney affirmation form and write down the course code. The attorney affirmation form and a copy of today's slides can be obtained in the resource list widget at the bottom of your screen. For New York attorneys, those of you with less than two years of experience will not be eligible for CLE today. Completed attorney affirmation form should be emailed to Christina Wade, and her email address is cwade, W-A-D-E, at foley.com. CLE certificates will be sent to eligible attendees via email in approximately eight weeks. Questions can be submitted during the web conference by entering them in the Q&A widget, which is open on the left side of your screen. We'll answer questions at the end as time permits. Joining us on today's panel are Rachel Zeldin, Gabe Drapos, Neil Solomon, and Sam Glick. Rachel Zeldin is Head of Network Partnerships at Collective Health and is responsible for fostering productive relationships with organizations across the healthcare financing sector. Prior to joining Collective Health, Rachel was a, par a principal in the health and life sciences practice at Oliver Wyman. She received her bachelor's degree from Stanford and her PhD in organic chemistry from UC Berkeley. Gabe Drapos is Chief of Staff to the CEO at Oscar, a health insurance startup that is using technology, design, and data to help humanize and simplify healthcare. Previously, he was Head of Marketing at Oscar, running the company's campaigns across all markets, including the launch of their California and Texas business in 2015. Prior to joining Oscar, he worked in the investment program at Bridgewater Associates and at The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. He holds a BA, magna cum laude in philosophy from Harvard University. Neil Solomon is co-founder and chief medical officer at MedZed, where he is responsible for developing the company's service platform, overseeing caregivers, selecting telemedicine and other in-home technologies, managing the clinical process, and helping clients get the most value from our services. Until recently, Neil served as vice president for quality and care system transformation for Blue Shield of California. Previously, he held clinical leadership roles at HealthNet, Kaiser Permanente, the Institute for Medical Knowledge Implementation, and Care Guide. He is a graduate of the Yale University School of Medicine and board certified in internal medicine. Sam Glick is a partner in Oliver Wyman's Health and Life, Sci Life Sciences practice and a San Francisco office leader. He focuses on consumer-centric healthcare, working with leading providers, health plans, employers, enablement companies, retailers, and venture capital firms to find innovative, engaging, engaging ways to bend trend. To get started, each of our speakers will be taking a few minutes to introduce themselves and their companies, and then Sam will be walking us through some data related to new portals for consumer access to healthcare. After that, we'll have some time for discussion among the speakers. First up, we have Gabe Drapos from Oscar Healthcare. Gabe? Hi hey there. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes here to talk about Oscar and um, tell you sort of where we, where, where we started, where we're going, and sort of what our strategy is here. Um, so we are a health insurance company um, that we, we think of ourselves as technology-driven um, through data, design, engineering, smarter ways of approaching health insurance. Um, we launched in 2012, uh, started in New York. We were the first uh, health insurer in New York in 15 years at that point. Um, and we launched sort of to coincide with the launch of the Affordable Care Act. So our first sort of day's opening for, for sale were in October of 2013. Um, and by t January 2014, we were handling our first claims, processing our first numbers eligibility, and all of that. Um, 
since then, uh, we expanded into New Jersey, northern New Jersey, and then most recently this past uh, November, expanded into parts of California and Texas, most specifically L.A., Orange County in California, Dallas, Fort Worth, and San Antonio in Texas. Uh, and we had a successful year this past year. We signed up over 140,000 members across those four markets, um, starting at, you know, in our first year in New York, 17,000 members. So it's been, it's been an exciting growth path. Um, and, you know, personally, I can say that when I started, we were at about 50 employees, and now we're at around 500. Um, one thing that's always good to explain is we are a full-stack insurer. So we have our own licenses in each state. We have our own financial reserves, our own network and operations. Um, we you know, aren't just an app. We're not just a, a website. Um, we're sort of the, the whole thing. And um, throughout the past four years, we've raised $720 million from various uh, venture funds, including Founders Fund, Google Capital, Goldman Sachs, and Wellington. So I'm going to go through a little bit about our sort of strategy. We call it the Oscar flywheel, um, and just sort of talk through what we think our, our path to success is, and also what the model that we think we can use to improve healthcare does. The first step, sign up members. Like I said, we started doing that in October of 2013, signed up about 17,000 members. And obviously the goal here is we need to have a membership base to operate a functioning insurance company. Um, so it's pretty self-explanatory. Step two is to build trust with members and engage them with the product. And really what we're talking about here is um, we think that Oscar needs to be sort of the entry point into the healthcare system for our members. So when you're looking for care, we want you to come to us. We'll help you find you know, the right doctor or several possible doctors, nurses, whatever you need. Um, we want to be proactive at getting members to engage with the product. Um, one example here that I can share is uh, last year we started giving all of our members free fitness trackers. Uh, and for each day that they met their walking goal, we paid them a dollar. Um, at the end of the month, they could cash out and get that, that money in Amazon gift cards. And one interesting thing that we saw here was that people who used the Misfit um, com compared to a control group that didn't engaged with other services that we offered at a higher rate. Uh, they used our telemedicine more. They used our uh, member services lines more. They used our care rudder where we help people find doctors and drugs in our formulary more. And really what we think is going on there is that, you know, each day to, to get that, that dollar, they needed to log in, sync with the app, and sort of build, build a, um, you know, a, I guess a, a habit of uh, using Oscar and engaging with Oscar. And that really sort of proliferated out to all of the other uh, product lines and services that we provided. Next step is to guide members, um, compile real-time health insights. And so here, you know, what, like I said, we want to be the entry point to healthcare. And what that means is when members are looking for care, we want them to come to us. So, you know, if they're looking for a doctor, they'll call in and we can sort of help them find the doctor that's best for them. Um, and really the idea here is that if we are being smart about, you know, surfacing the best options and being smart about um, helping members get care when they need it, uh, over time this will lead to members being um, in healthier, those with conditions to have those conditions controlled better, and, uh, you know, everybody sort of wins. Step four, we think, is build an end-to-end -end experience with providers. And here what we mean is, look, the members are part of the equation. If we can engage our members and help them move through the healthcare system, that's great, but it's not the entirety of the battle. We need to have members and providers working well together, and maybe that means appointment scheduling. So if you need to see a doctor quickly, we can help you do that because we have a close relationship with the providers. Um, maybe it means pushing uh, information to the provider. So, you know, if you have a primary care doctor and you go to them and see them again at some point in the future, but in between had an ER visit, well, normally the doctor doesn't know about that. So we want to push that information to the doctor so that they're aware of what care you're experiencing beyond what they're experiencing with you. Um, and that just all of those things help to build a closer relationship between members and providers, um, which we think, you know, will we'll make people healthier, will make the system move more efficiently, and all of that. And finally, you know, if we can make things move more efficiently and help the system progress, 
um, we think that we can build a better product for a lower price. If we find those inefficiencies and sort of um, remove them through this, this strategy, um, we'll improve our, our medical loss ratio, we'll improve our ability to handle expensive care, uh, and offer what we think of as a really high quality product that also improves the cost. So I'll pause there. Thank you, Gabe. Um, next, we have Neil Solomon from MedZed. Great. Thank you. Um, pleasure to be with everyone today. Uh, MedZed is a, um, a telemedicine-enabled home care company that uh, began in Atlanta and now is also operational in California. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the problem that we're trying to solve, um, why we're passionate about it, and, uh, and how we're getting it done. So the problem that we've identified is that about 5% of people drive half of all healthcare costs. In almost any population where you look, there will be a small share of people who are complicated and sick, and um, those people frequently have difficulty using the healthcare system the way it is designed today. Um, as a physician, I can tell you that when I practiced, everybody came to me at the time that we told them to come. In other words, it was built around me, my schedule, and my office. And unfortunately for complicated, uh, sick individuals, people who may have many medical conditions, they may have social challenges, financial burdens, et cetera, it's difficult for them to play the game that way. And as a consequence, they're at very high risk for failing. And, uh, and that's why we see that they end up costing a lot of money. They end up using the emergency department frequently, they end up getting admitted to the hospital multiple times. Frequently, they can't go home from the hospital directly. They'll need to go to other facilities for care, and their costs mount. Um, and so it's a small share of people who the system doesn't work for today that we really wanted to build a better system for. Um, in addition to the challenges that they have in, in getting to the doctors, um, a lot of times doctors don't understand why those people are failing they don't have a really good view of what's going on in their lives. When those patients do show up in the doctor's office, they often put on their best outfit and they look the part as best they can for the 15 minutes of the conversation. They may even withhold information. So the doctor doesn't have a particularly good view as to why that patient is failing. So those two things, the access to doctors in a consistent way and the, the, the failure to see what's going on in their lives, we thought we could address by essentially flipping the care. Instead of the patients coming to the doctor, we take the, the care to the patient's home. We can take it to a care facility, we can take it to a place of work, but we take it to the patient, usually in the home. And the way we do that is we have care providers. Today they are nurses of various um, levels of training, everything from a nurse practitioner to an RN down to an LPN. And tomorrow it will include uh, paramedics, um, home health aides, and a variety of other profiles. And we train those people to do really good home-based care. They do things like medication reconciliation, um, they screen for depression and dementia, they assess for fall risks, they evaluate self-management skills, they have conversations about end-of-life uh, desires and management. Um, and when they go to the home of these patients, they bring with them a mobile telemedicine unit. So they have a backpack. We've taken things that frequently are seen in hospitals now on big carts, and we've sort of stripped them off the cart, found the most valuable and lightweight pieces, and put them into a backpack. Um, we've written software to link them together and to make it really easy uh, to connect a remote physician into the home uh, with that technology. So after the first part of the visit where the care provider uh, interviews the patient, works with the patient, gathers information, develops a relationship, part two of the visit is bringing the doctor into the visit remotely. And the doctor has a Bluetooth stethoscope that the sound quality is as if, is as if he or she were at the bedside, high-resolution cameras to look down the throat, look at rashes and lesions. Um, and uh, obviously video conferencing, uh, HIPAA compliant video conferencing, and we're looking at several other pieces of technology as well. So the doctor can do a full physical exam and then make a care plan, uh, create, uh, have new diagnoses, established diagnoses, um, 
um, make referrals if needed, prescribe, et cetera. And then the doctor leaves the visit and the care provider stays there and reviews the care plan with the patient. So the patient has confidence that he or she can actually follow through and be successful with the care plan. And then we string those visits together just the way uh, a complex patient might come to a doctor at a regular interval. We go to them at a regular interval. And we can also go to them in between those visits if they start to decompensate. The patient can call and say, gee, I'm not feeling right. I've got a really bad headache. I have a fever. I'm, I'm a little bit short of breath, whatever it may be. And we can initiate an acute visit, too, in order to prevent that patient failing, going to the ER and starting the cycle of uh, hospitalization and institutionalization. So the idea is to keep these patients uh, comfortable, happy, and healthy at home for as long as possible. That's the whole premise of our company. Um, we're doing that, uh, as I said, in uh, two markets right now, and um, it appears that we'll be growing into several other markets uh, in the second and third quarter of this year. So uh, we do this in a variety of settings. Obviously, it's for the highest risk patients. So Medicare and Medicaid patients um, are particularly good for us because they are, uh, there's a high concentration of complicated patients, but it works for any patient who's complicated. Um, and uh, in terms of the receptivity, it's extremely high. Um, we link this back to physicians who the patient knows. So wherever we work with a health system, we try to use the physicians in that health system, in fact, even the patient's own primary care doctor, to be the remote doctor so there's continuity of care. We can document in the electronic health records that that patient is already in with, with his or her own health system. So we try to do that. When we work with insurers, however, we usually become the doctor of record because there often isn't one. And so we have a professional services corporation in a couple of states now um, and can provide the, um, the full end-to-end -end care on a continuity basis for those patients. So that's what we're doing. It's sort of a new twist on telemedicine. It's basically using telemedicine as an enabler uh, to care for the most challenging patients in our healthcare system. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Um, with that, I'll turn it to Rachel Zeldin of Collective Health. All right. Thank you. And I'm happy to be here and talk a little bit more about Collective Health with all of you. Uh, so to start, you know, we looked at the healthcare marketplace and we're thinking of what are a lot of the forces for change in the market and it really became very clear that employers are in a very good position to shape the U.S. healthcare system. Employers cover about 155 million Americans and spend roughly $1 trillion on healthcare a year and so they're a big force in shaping the way that healthcare sort of works in, in the U.S. Um, but as we started talking to employers, and particularly self-funded employers, it became clear that a lot of employers need a different set of products and services than they've traditionally had access to so that they can really administer their health care benefits and you know, provide the service that they want to their employees and their employees' families. And so we went about sort of thinking about what an employer would really need to do this and came up with three sort of basic things. So the first is kind of the basic platform on which we rest, which is supercharged plan administration. And you can think of this a little bit like a TPA on steroids. So we're administering plans and adjudicating claims, but we're doing this with the best technology sort of out there and, and doing this much more efficiently. Um, the next is providing the best access to networks and programs out in the marketplace. So this includes everything that you would traditionally think of as part of your health benefits, so medical, pharmacy, dental, vision, but also incorporating the other products and services that are emerging in the market around health and wellness and bringing that to employers in a way that feels holistic so they can manage it as one offering versus a lot of disparate parts. And lastly, it's about the experience, and it's the experience for both the member as well as for the you know, people at the employer that are administering the benefit. And it's combining technology, design, and actual humans to create an experience that's differentiated and value-added. So to dive in a little bit more about what the collective experience is, 
And when we, we look at this, we think about it from two perspectives. One is from the individual member, and one is from the HR and finance teams that are sort of managing this on, on their behalf. And from a member's perspective, we think that the collective experience begins before you're even enrolled. So this means that during the open enrollment process, you're supported with the information that you need to choose the plan that's right for you. I think a lot of times, even for those of us who are in the industry, you go to sign up for health benefits and it's like everything that you knew went out the window. We're trying to make it so that people can make good decisions. Uh, this also means that once you are enrolled, everything documenting your plan and your coverage is easy to understand and written in plain English. So that once you go to use your coverage, you know both how to use it and that there aren't too many surprises down the line. We provide a suite of online and mobile tools for members so that if they have a question or need to go and use their coverage, they can self-serve. This includes things like going to find a provider and you go and log into our member portal and you the only the providers that are in your plan show up so that you know that you're going to someone that's in network, uh, just as an example. And you can also see things like, how am I doing towards my deductible? What does my HSA look like? Uh, so it becomes a lot easier to kind of run your benefits yourself as a member. But sometimes things happen and it's, it's really hard and you need some help. And for that, we have premium member support. There's one number that you call and you talk to one person. And that person can answer questions that you have about your medical, your pharmacy, sort of anything in the health benefits space. Uh, that one individual is empowered to do so and sort of creates a really great experience for them. So on the flip side, for your HR team, we'll talk a little bit about this on the next slide, but. We want to make it so that the HR and finance teams are focusing on their employees and not focusing on sort of running the health plan. And so what we're able to do is leverage technology and data to create streamlined workflows so that they're not spending all of their time thinking about, you know, how do I make sure that my eligibility file is uploaded? We have integrated data and reporting so that people can make decisions about the benefits they're providing for their employees. Uh, with a lot more information. You know, I think there's a lot in the market where people sort of read trends and say, I think that this will be good for my organization. We're providing the data so that people can make those decisions with a lot more tailored insights. Related to this is the management dashboard. So both the HR and finance teams can track, you know, eligibility in real time. They can see how much they're spending. You know, if you're trying to manage a budget, you can see how you're doing on the health side, you know, against the, the targets that you've set, uh, which is really helpful for folks. And then lastly, you know, there's so many great solutions out in the marketplace for employers to provide to their employees and to their families. Uh, but I think it's, you know, there's a lot of challenge in how do I choose those partners, how do I operationalize those partners? And so we're able to support that, um, not only helping them sort of choose what they think might be the best for their populations, but then also measuring the return once those have been implemented. So we at Collective Health, you know, we believe that there can be a better healthcare experience, and we work with organizations that believe that better is possible as well. You know, we work with clients that are all across the country and are all in different industries, but this belief that better is possible is a real sort of unifying theme. And this kind of means, you know, we hear this manifest in four different things we hear from employers. It's, they want their members to brag about their benefits. They want this to be something that's a value proposition of working at this employer, and they want it to bring the employer and the employee uh, kind of closer together and create a better connection uh, to the organization. And these are HR teams and finance teams that want to spend time thinking about their people and not thinking about the process of running a health plan. And they're looking to better technology solutions to help them do that. They want to access data the way that they're accessing it in making all of their other business decisions when they make decisions about their health care benefits. And they also want to be able to readily harness new ideas and innovations and sort of plug that into their, their overall benefits offering much more easily than they have historically. And that's ready to hand it back to you, Alexis.
Thanks, Rachel. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Sam Glick of Oliver Wyman. Thanks, Alexis. Much appreciated. And uh, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes here really to to tee up the questions and the conversation that we're going to have with uh, the innovative firms that we've heard from already here. But, um, you know, I think as we as we look at and as we do our research about new ways that people are accessing healthcare, it's often helpful to think about uh, the backdrop against which that's happening. Uh, for many years, um, we have operated in a healthcare environment where the commercially insured population, the employers uh, of the world, pay 140 or 150% of the bills. Uh, they subsidize uh, Medicare and Medicaid and the uncompensated patients, uh, and they keep the whole system running at the levels at which it runs today. Um, something really um, important happened last year, which was last year uh, was the first year in history that the average commercially insured person uh, was in a high deductible plan, whether it was called that or not. And so the average plan deductible for a commercially insured person uh, across the legal definition of high deductible. And that creates some really meaningful impacts on the system. Uh, it means for that the first time ever uh, in most years, the typical commercially insured person who may go for a primary care visit, may get one prescription a month, is paying for all of their own health care in that year. And their insurance card is a discount card, but they really don't use it until those uh, years when they may have to go to the hospital or they have more expenses. Uh, it means that Despite many years of talking about shopping about healthcare, they now have an incentive to do that. Um, it also means that um, there are challenges for those uh, who have uh, average levels of income in the United States. You know, the, the average American says they can't find $2,000 to pay a medical bill within 30 days. Uh, and this kind of change in deductible means that more and more people are exposed to that. Uh, and so, you know, the solution to this historically and why I'm so glad to hear um, from Collective Health and Oscar and MedZed here. Uh, the solution to this historically has been shift costs onto consumers, give them good tools to shop, let them know what different services cost, uh, and they will make good decisions and bring down their cost of health care. Um, what the data are now showing us is that's not what they do. Um, these are data from Ben Handel, and what he finds uh, in, a, in a very well-run uh, controlled experiment here is that as costs get shifted on to consumers, they reduce spending largely indiscriminately. They don't understand the system. They don't know how to navigate the system. Uh, and so rather than shopping and finding a cheaper place for that MRI or a cheaper place to have their baby uh, or uh, learning about lower cost sites of care, what they tend to do is just not get care until they need it. Uh, and so their mix of care doesn't necessarily change in any meaningful way. Uh, what happens is their utilization overall drops. And this this is a challenge. You know, I think the MedZed and Collective Health and Oscar, um, you know, have an opportunity here, but also a challenge here where we need to be doing the right thing for people given their economic incentives in a current year. Uh, but we also need to be thinking about how if we're not getting them in for preventative care, if we're not getting them in for those things uh, that they may now be avoiding as they're paying more of the costs, um, that we'll have a problem systemically down the line. Um, the other thing is, and, and I think Neil mentioned this a bit, um, which is new types of care and new sites of care, whether it's retail or telemedicine um, or standalone walk-in clinics or urgent cares, um, are not just being used by the commercial population. Uh, we recently did a, a nationwide survey of a little over 2,000 people, uh, and what you see on the chart here is the percentage of people in a particular segment in our survey and the percentage of uh, people in that segment uh, or the percentage of those by segment who use retail care. And what you find is that um, retail care is now used pretty much at the same level across the commercial, the individual, the Medicaid, and the Medicare segments. Uh, every segment, kind of regardless of their coverage, is finding um, more convenient ways uh, to engage with the healthcare system to be very attractive to them. And so I think some of the kind of old or at least early logic about retail care, that this was really for the commercially insured person who wanted to come in for a physical at 9 a.m. on a Saturday and pay cash for it, uh, just doesn't hold. Uh, and we need to find ways to, to provide better ways to access the system for everybody. 
Um, the kind of last stat I'll highlight, and again from this survey that we just did, is that um, people are increasingly willing to use new types of care. The big challenge uh, is getting them in in the first place. What we see across, and I've picked three here, but you see this with telemedicine, you see this with home care, um, across drugstores, grocery stores, mass stores, that um, once somebody has had prior use of one of those services, uh, they are much more likely to come in and want to use it again. Uh, and that's a really powerful result, which is the, the, the trick for us is hooking them, showing them a better way, getting them into the health system in a better way, uh, and, then, and then we have uh, a real opportunity to build loyalty. On the other side, interestingly, this was the first time that there were enough people uh, new to the healthcare system due to the expansion of the Affordable Care Act uh, that we could ask people who hadn't had recent experience in a traditional doctor's office the same question. Uh, and what we find is that if you've been to a traditional doctor's office before, you're actually less likely to want to go again. Uh, so we're finding that, that new convenient care creates loyalty and traditional sites of care actually destroy it. Uh, and that's, that's a fundamental opportunity uh, for disruption and, and to serve people um, more appropriately. So I'll end uh, by hopefully teeing up some, some questions and discussion uh, among our group here, but um, the kinds of things we're seeing, the sh cost shifting uh, on to commercial patients, the expansion of access under the Affordable Care Act, the interest across uh, segments in the healthcare spectrum in new types of care and new types of engaging with the healthcare system, uh, and just the general trend uh, of consumerism that we see across industries, um, really creates a kind of consumer bill of rights. We should be able to deliver more affordable, more available, more accessible, more personalized, simplified, better care uh, to people. Uh, and I'm hoping we can have a discussion today with our innovators about uh, exactly how you do that. So thank you. Thanks, Sam, and, and thanks, everybody, for your introductions. I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started with some questions. I have a, a few questions uh, sort of specific to each of you, but and also some for all everybody. So just um, my first question is for Gabe and Oscar, and, and I'll let anybody else chime in as, as we go along. But as consumers begin to engage more actively in their care and request more con transparency in health care, um, you know, access to upfront price information, results, and quality measures. Are you finding that traditional providers are unwilling or hesitant to engage and are cooperated as may be necessary to really, um, you know, provide the information to consumers the way they're looking for it? Yeah, you know, first off, I want to say I totally agree. You know, the landscape is certainly changing, uh, and we see we see mixed reactions to this among the provider community. That's how I would characterize it. Um, you know, I think some are more more than aware of sort of what we view the situation being, that the nature of price increases is something that we sort of all have to collectively find a solution to. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of them agree with us, um, sort of the Oscar view, that the best way to provide that cohesive healthcare experience is for the provider and the insurer to join forces here. Um, and that's the best way to serve the, the best interests for the consumer. Um, there are providers that understand price transparency and better integration are just sort of the starting point for this transition. Um, and we believe it's ultimately sort of those providers that will sort of end up on top as the change in people's attitudes become more apparent. Um, you know, I, why do I think Oscar is sort of the perfect partner here? Um, we want to share risk and reward. And so, in other words, we we want to align incentives with patient outcomes. And with partners who sort of want to build these tools with us and want to ensure um, that our members are cared for in the right manner, there's always sort of been that corollary or that correlation, rather, to partners that are willing to, to sort of step up and share risk and align their incentives. Um, so I would say, you know, our hope is that as time goes on, more provider systems will have the same philosophy on this. Um, but for right now, we've got sort of superb partners across our networks uh, and our different regions that are sort of wanting to step up, wanting to um, share risk, wanting to build these tools to help us integrate with them and, you know, guide the member more efficiently. Thanks, Gabe. Um, and to Rachel and Neil, are you finding sort of that traditional payers are willing to engage with you um, and integrate your services or, or are you using and willing at, to think outside the box or, or are you finding, um, you know, that you have to, as 
Gabe said, who's you know they're working with selective providers for now, that you have to they make your way selectively as, as these new technologies start to become more commonplace. Hi, this is Rachel. Um, we have have some really outstanding partnerships with you know your traditional big payers, and you know, the relationships work because we're able to sort of work with payers and things that they do really well and provide a new perspective on how they you know approach the self-funded employer market. So we've found that it's actually been a a really productive relationship that we've had. Um, this is Neil. I would um, add a few comments. Uh, one is that um, everybody that we've talked to, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 70 organizations, has said, you guys are doing the right thing. This is what our country needs. This is what our community needs. Um, you're on to something here. This is a great service. But talk is cheap. You know, we, could, we can get people excited about the idea, but what we find is that there are very conservative and bureaucratic uh, organizations trying to make uh, new decisions. And it's much easier to say no in a lot of these organizations than to say yes. Nobody's going to get on you if you sort of just decide to pass on that thing. Um, if you embrace it, it's a risk. And it also means a lot of work to implement. And it may mean at the expense of something else. There's only so much time in a day, and so there are opportunity costs. And so there are risks involved in trying things that are new that are hard for some of these organizations to um, accept and to embrace. Um, I think that is especially true in ones that are physician-dominated. Um, and as a physician, I'll make a kind of sweeping statement, which is, I'm sure, unfair, but that physicians typically tend to be relatively conservative in their decision-making, and this is why. We're taught first do no harm. And so with patients, you wouldn't take a big risk and try out a new medicine that has no track record in their set situation. Um, you'd go carefully and slowly. And I think that it, it uh, just begins to condition the way that physicians think about most issues and questions, is they do it incrementally and slowly. And so especially in physician organizations, um, that's a problem. Even we are targeting uh, ACO, next generation ACOs, hospital systems that are now in bundled payment arrangements, hospitals that are um, uh, losing money in the readmission um, uh, programs from CMS where there are penalties for high readmission rates. And uh, so even if there's a business opportunity, it's a very long, slow uh, decision-making process. Many people have to get involved. And it can take 9, 12, 18 months to make a decision. And I think that's a challenge for innovating in the healthcare system. But, um, you know, there are opportunities that uh, the others have talked about, which is if you go straight to an employer um, who's managing their, um, the benefits for their employees, you may have more receptivity in that market. And we're trying several things now to try to break through, but I think that those are some of the barriers that do exist today. Neil, and you sort of interest this interesting segue to a, a next question, but you know, if you're finding that large providers are, are difficult to work within, how about sort of Medicare, Medicaid organizations across the country? Um, you know, as the government is, is our largest payer still um, and could greatly benefit with some of these new technologies, but um, are, are you finding, I know, you know, on telehealth specifically, we're seeing you know, Medicare start to acknowledge that telehealth can be a valuable service and they're starting to loosen the requirements in some of their um, various demonstra demonstration projects. But um, are you seeing any movement in within the government to sort of embrace these new platforms um, and, and sort of be able to bring these services to the Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid population? Yeah, uh, we definitely are seeing movement, I think, at a much faster pace than um, had been true in, the say, the decade before. Um, as you pointed out, it, uh, Medicare through CMMI and demonstration projects um, has begun to relax um, and create new waivers for telemedicine specifically and also for some new models of care. So yes, um, but usually what it then uh, devolves to is, and then how exactly do you get paid? What does the code look like? How much do you get right. paid for it? And so 
Um, it hasn't, in many instances, worked down to that level of execution yet. And, uh, you know, I think it will, but it's, um, it's a slow slog. I happen to sit on a, an AMA CPT telemedicine committee that's now working on new codes for telemedicine. But until those CPT codes are out and the government says, yes, you can use them and we will pay X amount for them, um, that won't happen. And those CPT codes can't come out until 2018, I think, at the earliest. So, so there's some delay there. At the state level, depending on the state, there's also quite a bit of movement. Uh, I'm in California, and uh, we work in California, and we're seeing um, some innovation for uh, bundled payments and, uh, and risk-based care, even in the Medicaid system, which we call Medi-Cal in California. So yeah, there is innovation, and obviously it's state by state. I won't go through all 50 states, but so there is movement. Um, and I think that, you know, five years from now, it's going to, the landscape is going to look quite different, both at the federal and at most state levels. So there is movement going on, and it just has to kind of trickle down to then how do you execute uh, on these new models. And, Rachel, sort of along those lines, can you see you, sort of your new platforms for care administration making their way into government-funded and care? Um, will Medicare and Medicaid be able to benefit from these new approaches to administrating benefits? I, absolutely. I, you know, the, the counterpoint to $1 trillion being spent on employer-sponsored care is that $1 trillion is being spent on government-sponsored care and the other major payer. Uh, just because it, it's agnostic to who is funding your health care, whether or not as a member you need support in making better decisions and you want to have you know, the right data at the right time to sort of make decisions. And you know, in, in some ways governments are struggling with providing care within budgets and just as much as the employer. So, so there's certainly a need in both of those markets, and I think these solutions um, should apply you know, sort of agnostic to to where the source of, of funding is coming from. I, I think especially as you look at, you know, the move towards managed Medicaid plans at the state level, um, as well as, you know, the continued growth of Medicare Advantage, and there's absolutely room for this approach to administration to sort of expand. Thank you. Um, now, an, a question for all three of you, and, and um, I, I, you know, you can ask, answer whenever, you know, as you come with an answer, but how are these new solutions, do you think, going to influence, the, you know, the triple aim of, of health care to provide, you know, a better patient experience, higher quality care, and, and at lower cost? And, and which of those factors do you think your organizations are, are best suited to sort of help work within? I don't know if somebody uh, wants to start. I'll Thank start you. because um, um, we're very much uh, clinically oriented, and so we think a lot about the triple aim. In fact, we think about the quadruple aim, which adds in sustainability for physician practices. Um, so um, clearly, if we're working with the most complicated patients and we're helping them stay healthy, we're reducing the most expensive parts of utilization and cost. Um, however, we're also doing some other things that are important. Um, quality, at least as it's defined by regulators and uh, other organizations like NCQA, um, comes down to, say, HEDIS measures, among other things. And as someone who ran HEDIS measures and, uh, and Medicare STAR programs previously, I know that what drags down those scores are the patients who don't come in and you can't find. Well, those are exactly the patients that at MedZed we go to. And so we can actually do uh, closing of care gaps in the home with things like delivering um, uh, fit kits for colon cancer screening, uh, doing retinal uh, eye exams in the home with a, a camera that takes a picture and sends it to an ophthalmologist, et cetera. So we can close care gaps. And so insofar as quality is defined that way, we're able to help close that. And then in terms of just the entire patient experience, I said we're working with those patients who have the most difficulty utilizing the system today. It doesn't work for them. They don't know how to use it. They can't use it. They can't access it. It's too many bus rides. They can't leave their spouse home alone, whatever it may be. We go to them. And so in um, our the one place where we've studied the um, experience, we did uh, something called a net promoter score, which typically in healthcare is a very low number. And uh, we scored an 80 on a net promoter score, which is asking people essentially, would you recommend the service to your 
friends and family. And so it was very high. And, um, and we found that, in fact, in some of the homes we went to, there were multiple people living in the home. The other people in the house said, how do I get that service? So it was just sort of a, also an a indication that people liked the service. So um, we think that we can help on all three parts of the triple aim. And on that sustainability part, which I call the quadruple aim, these are the patients that clog up doctors' offices and make it really difficult to practice because it blows up the schedule for the whole afternoon if someone kind of slowly shuffles into an exam room and takes about 45 minutes to an hour to do all the parts of the exam and get them out and then move another patient in, and then the schedule is done, you know, it's kind of blown up for the day. So physicians like the fact that this can make them more efficient. So um, I think that that's um, a, a way that we at least are trying to address quadruple aim. I think that you guys um, in the other organizations are doing it in, in other ways. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with sort of what my view on the Oscar answer would be. Um, you know, I would say first, you know, on, on the, the sort of patient experience, quality and satisfaction um, topic, we're using, as I said, tools that make evident to our members what the right information is at the right time, whether that's sort of, we think of it as human and machine, you know, the technology can't solve everything but it's to make things easier at certain points. And when it can't, uh, you know, having, having excellent uh, member services and nurses on staff that can, can help as well and having those people be available and ready to answer your questions and giving those people, too, the tools um, at hand that, that are needed to answer those questions quickly and accurately, um, which, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we think makes searching for care not only simple, um, but accessing that care easy. Uh, so second, I would say on improving, you know, let's say health of populations, um, that we have programs that incentivize healthy behavior. Now, I, t I talked about MISFIT earlier, our fitness tracking program. Um, but another example I, I want to share on this is uh, we, we ask members when they sign up to fill out a health risk assessment online. And last year, we did a, a bit of a study where we, we sort of did an A-B where 10 um, Half of members got a $10 Amazon gift card for filling it out, and the other half, uh, you know, for the control. And we, we saw a, a change there from a 50% completion rate in the control group to about 65%. Now, rewarding members to fill out an HRA isn't sustainable, really. Um, it's not, you know, long term. And so this year, instead, we we tried to do a, a redesign to our onboarding flow and move the needle from 50 to 75% in this new onboarding flow. So that's just sort of, you know, it's, it's incredible. We've seen in a few instances the ways in which you can change behavior just by changing and making the tools easier. Um, and, you know, obviously the end goal there is, you know, if we have better uh, information on the health profile of our members, we can reach out to them, be proactive about getting their conditions under control and keeping them healthier. Um, Finally, on, on reducing cost, uh, I would say, you know, I talked a bit about sort of the, the overall Oscar vision of how we keep costs reduced. Um, but, you know, that, that's sort of the long term. In the short term, you know, one thing I want to point to is we were talking about telemedicine earlier. And like I said, I, we have at Oscar a telemedicine for free for all of our members. Um, and you can just go into the app and, you know, a doctor will call you. What we saw over the past couple of years that if we took, if we looked at all of the cases of bronchitis or other upper respiratory um, situations, 90% of our members had their condition successfully treated via telemedicine. What I mean by that is 90% of those members had no follow-up claim um, as a result. Uh, so they never went to the doctor, they never went to urgent care, they most likely got the prescription that they needed delivered to their pharmacy. That lowers costs for everybody. Um, it's less expensive for us than a doctor appointment or an ER visit or urgent care. And like I said, it's uh, it's free to the member. So that's my answer. Um, and this is Rachel from Collective Health, and and we agree with with all the points, you know, and and think that those that Oscar just made, and and that's certainly something that we strive to do. I, I think just one thing that we would add, you know, given that we're working with an employer population, it's Sort of acknowledging that the healthcare system can be challenging to navigate and sort of building benefits literacy and healthcare literacy um, for members. And in, in sort of parallel with that, working with HR teams to not just 
design communications, but also to design plans that sort of take into the account that you know, members aren't necessarily going to act rationally. I, I think what we see, you know, a couple, I guess 20 minutes or so when Sam was talking about high deductible health plans, and it's hard to manage a high deductible health plan as a member and, and coming up with plan designs that sort of allow members to make good decisions, not only for their physical health, but also their financial health is going to be really important in getting to sort of the, the experience, the, the quality outcomes and the costs that, that we all strive for. And, and just one last question, I, I, we have sort of just a few more minutes, but are you finding that with these new technologies and as, you beca as, as consumers, both employers and individuals who are seeking care, begin to start engaging with these new technologies, and I think, uh, you know, I think Gabe, you may have, have touched on this, and I think a few of you may have touched on this, are, are they actually starting to make educated decisions, um, you know, getting care sort of at the right time or earlier or in the right format, or are, are people spending or or use of care sort of staying fairly similar to what it was before? Uh, Gabe here. Uh, I would say, you know, that there's, there's obviously a spectrum of um, understanding and the amount of sort of uh, care and guiding that people need um, depending on sort of their situation. And, you know, it's not just technology, it's not just people. Um, you know, that all of this has to, to work together here. You know, one thing that I can point to that we've seen is uh, in our second year, we started releasing what we call our simple plans. And basically what they are, um, you have a deductible and a maximum out of pocket that are the same number. And then you have a lot of uh, benefits that are, are in there from day one. Um, and so what we found is it was a, a nice way to sort of deal with the high deductible problem. Um, because, you know, yeah, you may have, let's say, a $3,000 max, but, you know, you have a very clear message that you can send to members where you're going to get your PCP visits for free, you're going to get your generic drugs for free, you're going to have free telemedicine, um, you're going to have labs for free. And so these things that people use commonly and sort of are um, engaged with by a large proportion of the population are things that they don't have to ask confusing questions about. Um, and so, or be confused by. And so that has definitely led, you know, we've seen utilization go in directions that we wanted it to, because um, there was a clarity of message there that we could communicate to people. And this, this is Rachel. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that consumers will sort of make better choices when they see all of their options in an integrated way. So they can see, you know, I've, I have access to a retail center, an urgent care center, a primary care center, and they're, they're seeing that all kind of laid out in one place. Uh, that's really what's helping people to make better choices. I think one of the challenges that you see in the marketplace is, is often all of that information is disparate. And so you'll have a lot of people who don't even know the things that they can access. They've never heard of it, or, or if they have, it's, it's confusing. So I, I, bringing it all together and, and showing it as part of one solution that they can leverage uh, will drive, uh, will lead to better decision making. Yeah, um, I'll just add one thing. Um, our model is really pretty different than the other two. Um, but the people that we're, we're working with um, frequently don't know how to use the healthcare system the way it's designed and the way that we expect them to. So they often don't really have a primary care doctor. They don't understand when it's appropriate to go in. And so we can help guide them in the use of services. So today I, I described our model of care where we have a care provider going into the home and linking back to a physician. Our longer term goal is to build a team-based model of care where sometimes it'll be a social worker who's connecting with a patient or a clinical pharmacist or a behavioral health specialist. And so we'll help guide that patient to the right levels of care given their needs, especially in this population where otherwise they may not know how to do it or, or choose the right time to do it for their clinical condition. Thanks, Neil, uh, and thank you to all of our speakers, to Gabe, to Rachel, to Sam, and to Neil uh, for joining us today. I think we've had a, an interesting discussion. I know we just got started. There's probably a lot more that we can get into. Um, while I, I 
finish up quickly and give a little more information. For anybody who is looking for CLE credit, um, the code which you can put into the box, uh, which should be on your screen now, is 96 M like monkey, C like cat, B like boy. Again, that's 96 M like monkey, C like cat, B like boy. Um, and as I said, I want to thank all our speakers for taking the time to be with us. Uh, thanks for everybody for attending. If we did not get to your questions, uh, we will do our best uh, to get back to you with responses. Uh, please keep an eye out for webinars in this future webinars in this series. Um, we should be getting an email uh, as we uh, roll the rest of the series out. Uh, and for people listening, uh, when you sign off, you'll be directed to a survey. We'd appreciate it if you could fill it out so you can uh, give us some feedback and we can tailor our future uh, webinars based on your feedback. Um, and included in the slide deck um, is uh, every all the speakers' email addresses if you have any questions that didn't get answered and want to go ahead and email them directly. Um, and and as I said, any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, we will go ahead and answer those um, via email as soon as we can. Um, Gabe, Sam, Neil, and Rachel, thanks so much. Um, Sam, did you have anything you wanted to wrap up with? No, I just want to <clears throat> thank everybody for making the time. And uh, as Alexis said, if we didn't get to your question, we'll follow up by email. Uh, and if you have more questions, send them our way. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.